Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. I am um, here with my co-host today, Cello, who is my hairdresser, and I can't believe I'm going live looking like this, but this is what he's doing to my hair today. He's pushed my glasses, <laughs> my sunglasses, down on top of my reading glasses, and has totally ruined my hair. And I have a party I need to go to today, so please don't poop in it. Morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Um, I just got a notification that we just went live. Um, so for those that may not know, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center teaching people across the world um, how to empower the lives of animals and the people that care for them. And we do that with uh, educating through our live stream services using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis. Yes. So we are here joined today with our special co-host, Cello, yours truly, and Milo, who is standing right next to me. If you can see him, has a little bit of bird poop on his back. I wonder how that happened. Anyways, so yeah, hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. We live stream, um, unless my travel schedule tells me otherwise, um, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Um, we do have a special guest coming on with us next week. He is a positive reinforcement um, dog trainer out of the UK. Um, I've spoke with him a couple of times. Um, pay attention because I've also been in touch with, oh, whoop, wrong end. Whoop, still wrong end. Good, good, nope. <laughs> I've been in touch with uh, Joel Vitovic. Uh, I'm talking with him currently behind the scenes, board certified behavior analyst. He's going to go live with us within our level two membership program. And he's also going to be joining us for another live stream here on Coffee with the Critters. Um, he, whenever I have him on, um, our attendance shoots through the roof. Um, Joel, I don't know if he knows this or not, is one of my mentors. Uh, I think he's a fascinating man with an amazing brain and a love for the use of applied behavior analysis with children within the autistic spectrum. And uh, we collaborate with the Autism Model School. Uh, that's where he works um, through our Ought to be Enriched program. We also collaborate with the Ohio State Veterinary um, students, and I will be down there. Um, Ohio State has asked me to come back next month. I am going to go. We scheduled it for October 22nd, um, where I will be presenting to their vet students. So, yay, good morning. We've got a lot going on today, and I've got a lot to get through, um, and hopefully um, I can get through all of that because we're going to start with several different things. Good morning, Laura, Eva, Sylvia, Melinda, Mary. I met Mary a couple weeks ago. Um, the awesome Katie, Stam, Lydia, Jan. Yay. Hey, good morning, everybody. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started because I have a lot to get through, like I said. A um, couple things we get through um, just to get this out of the way. Pay attention to our events page here on Facebook. You can see um, different places I'll be presenting. <laughs> um, and our live stream schedules here. <clears throat> also, if you join our email newsletter list, you won't have to miss, worry about missing an event, a live stream, what have you, because um, I post a lot of, try every other week, I send out an email newsletter. Um, I'm working on the next one, and it's going to have working with numerous species. Good morning, Melissa. Hey, Jennifer and Cam. Um, so you can sign up on our email newsletter list right here on our Facebook page, and be sure not to miss any important topics, discussions, upcoming workshops, events, because in 2020, the Animal Behavior Center is going to be packed with booking workshops if not one a month, at least one every month. And sometime we're going to have two a month. Um, special announcement that I've been waiting for a long time. 
Uh, we launched our new website. We started on this back before I headed to Key West. We started on this back in, can touch my nose? Started out back on this back in February. Um, it's launched. We're still working out some of the minor quirks, but um, it's extremely easy to navigate. There's some how-to videos on there. Um, and we focused on, the reason I wanted a new website was to focus on, um, hey, was to focus on our, <laughs> memberships and programs. <laughs> <laughs> so the majority of um, our services are online, but definitely not limited to. We have a lot of workshops. Um, we give a lot of webinars. Well, I guess that's online. And pay attention to our schedule on our new face or our new website, um, which is theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Uh, take a look. Let me know what you. What, what would you think? I know we're still working through a couple of little quirks, uh, but for the most part, we are extremely happy with it. I still have to, I have to work on the testimonials page and I'll do that in my spare time. But we have some awesome testimonials. Uh, we even have some video testimonials, but you can check that out on our website and um, you can always reach me if you have any questions, concerns. Um, my email is Laura, L-A-R-A, -A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com, and I check them all myself. So uh, take a look. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you find any problems, because uh, I think we launched it a little over a week ago, and we've been working the past week, working out some quirks. Those of you that are followers are, of ours might see yourself on our website. So um, to get started, Today's topic is a Q&A, and I have Cello, the awesome roller pigeon in here with me. And I always tell people, if you've never worked with or trained a pigeon, you are missing out on something just fabulous. They are extremely, I wanna say intelligent. How do, oh man, there goes my hair again. How do you define intelligence? <clears throat> well, that depends. There's numerous different definitions. Um, Animals are intelligent as they need to be and as intelligent as um, they've evolved to be. There goes my glasses. Um, so this is one of the, I mean, how I define intelligence is the opportunity, which each opportunity an animal has to interact within its environment, it can change the outcome or a consequence with each interaction. Um, that is the pigeon, that is the pig, that is the parrots, that's a lot of the animals that we work with. But um, I love working with very complex animals because with very complex animals comes very complex behavior issues. So um, yeah, my work is never ending. Rolling with cello. Hey, Brooke, there's Brooke down there from Parrot Hope Rescue in Manoa, Ohio. And I would love to get uh, Brooke and Parrot Hope on here with me. So let's do that. Anyways, if you've never had the inter opportunity to interact with a pigeon, you are missing out on something amazing. Um, Cello is involved in most of our workshops <laughs> that we have here at the Animal Behavior Center. Uh, we have a pigeon here to help represent uh, the work and the laws of behavior uh, of the most awesome B.F. Skinner. Yeah, there he leaves me with a bad hair day. There he leaves me with a bad hair day. <laughs> um, so I often tell people, um, my roller pigeon can do anything that your border collie can do. My roller pigeon just can do it with wings. Um, couple of things. So last week we didn't have a coffee with critters because we had the two day zoo workshop. Um, I gave the two day zoo workshop, which was phenomenal. It sold out in seven days and I already have some new dates planned. Um, some of those that were in the workshop last weekend are on here. Um, we have some dates planned for next year, 2020. 
for the zoo workshop again. We're going to have this one all over again, and then we're going to have a little more advanced uh, where I'm going to be putting, really putting the people to work where they're going to have to problem solve on their own. Um, but I will be there for guidance. So I wanted to show you a couple of photos from last weekend. Um, <clears throat> and we can lead this into our Q&A. Um, I love to work with and train animals I've never worked with before. We have some parrots that are not very happy that we're not in their room today. Um, so, and I like inner, I love working with animals I've never met before. Um, I love working with animals on the fly, pun intended. Um, what are we looking at? How do we define motivation? And <clears throat> um, what does motivation look like? So a lot of, most of the animals we worked with last week, and I'm going to show you some of them, but definitely not all of them. And like I said, let's lead this into our Q&A if you guys have questions. Um, each animal is its own individual, so I don't care if I've trained one bobcat, one parrot, one dog, one rottweiler. One rottweiler is going to be completely different from the next rottweiler. So how do I begin understanding what I'm looking at? Um, what does that lip quiver mean? What does flat feather placement mean? What does it mean when the mohawk comes up on the back of the back of whatever, Milo, yours truly standing here beside me? What does that mean? A lot of times I have no idea what I'm, behaviors I'm working with until I start training the animal. And that's exactly what we did with this bobcat was um, we started the training. We started the training with all the animals we interacted with uh, through cage bars so and off contact so we could get a clear read on behavior. And I talked about the use of targeting. Um, targeting is numerous and very underestimated in the power and its wide uses so i train a giraffe to target its butt cheeks to a corner okay um target means touch a particular body part to an object like in this photo joanna is getting the bobcat to touch its nose to the target stick um, uh, we worked with the giraffe showing a neck target, how the cue is visual. Put your hand up like this. The giraffe lowers his head and presses it into your hand. Um, that is the beginning stages of teaching a voluntary blood draw. And um, so there, the, the, the use of targeting is numerous. And it's often how I start communication with the animal. If the animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, the animal's learning. Um, it's what are you teaching it? And are you knowingly or unknowingly teaching it desired or undesired behaviors? Um, the animal's always the one that determines the reinforcer. And um, if the animal's giving a behavior, it serves a purpose. All animal, all behavior serves a purpose. It may be unrecognized what the reinforcer is for that behavior. You find out why the animal's doing something, you can um, identify the reinforcer. And we talked about last week how reinforcers are so much more than food. Um, we did with Bonkers Bobcat, um, I wasn't seeing a lot of motivation in the beginning. Moving slow, coming out, sitting back, yawning, looking around. Uh, we were trying to call it to touch its nose to a target. And it was kind of like, yeah, maybe, hmm, maybe not. What you got in the treat bag? Um, and I can stand up and do some live training sessions this morning for you to help show you what we look for. But when teaching a target, this is what I talked about in the zoo workshop last weekend. When the animal understands, thanks Chella, thanks for not doing that on my head. When the animal understands contingency, meaning if this, then this, if I touch my nose to this target stick, then this thing of high value comes, there's the contingency. If this, then this. 
then you will see behaviors change. And what I'm looking for is what are those behaviors that 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 body language, that behavior that that animal is exhibiting when I'm handing it a pot or delivering a positive reinforcer. That is one of the reasons why one of the things I start with is targeting. So I can get to understand that in that particular individual animal's body language. So um, behaviors. So we learned how, um, here's Melanie and Sylvia um, teaching using the target after the contingency of understanding if I touch my nose to this target stick, then things happen. So Melanie was getting creative by where she wanted to get the bobcat to go. So we talked about uh, recall training and using a target to begin recall. Recall means getting the animal to come to you on cue, whatever that cue is. Um, let me... Pam Riley made a comment. Hey, Kimberly. Pam says, do you take notes on new behavior so that you can reference back, like an encyclopedia reference book? Yes, Pam, I do. Um, we have it here at the center. We do it here at the center. Um, can I get your comment off? Hi, comment. Um, we do it here on the center. We have a log book. Um, those are great because a lot of times you don't think you're making progress when you actually are. There's a turkey vulture stationing. Okay, there, good. Um, yes, we keep a log book here. Um, I keep a log book on my phone with the different zoos I'm working with. And uh, we also write behaviors on the windows in the other animal room. Um, if you make it easy, the volunteers will do their follow-up. So we have neon um, window markers, and each window is assigned to a different animal. We will write what we're working on, reinforcers. Uh, we put the dates in the logbook. We put the dates so we can see it helps us determine um, if we see behavior we weren't expecting, is this due to something um, annually that happens, like migration season's getting ready to happen, so you're gonna see behavior change in Willie. Um, the turkey vulture, the education turkey vulture that's here for training from Nature's Nursery. Um, so yes, I do take notes. And um, it's really important. And we also are careful when we introduce somebody new to training. And you guys, the only reason I train is not because I ever wanted to be a professional animal trainer. Uh, my fascination and obsession in life is using applied behavior analysis with animals. Um, what I love to see animals enriched and empowered. And studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it's the animal's preferred form of enrichment. Um, I know that for a fact because I see and live it every single day of my life. Um, and a lot of times these animals work for us, not for the opportunity to receive food, but for the opportunity to be mentally and physically engaged. Um, I will see an animal pass up identical free food for the opportunity to work for it, which is called contra freeloading, which is a topic of um, Jim and I are going to talk about next weekend con for freeloading um, and its role in our behavior modification plans. We saw um, contra freeloading happening last week at the zoo workshop when the pigtail macaque passed up the opportunity to get free food from visitors which was just pick it up and eat it. And instead it chose to come over to me and work for the exact identical food, which took more effort. I was getting him to touch his nose to a target stick, recall. Um, he's a resource guarder. So we were working on um, him handing me objects from inside of his cage and us holding them together. So resource guarding is when an animal protects things of high value and, um, I don't think I've really met one animal that is not a resource guarder. I am a resource guarder. 
you anybody knows you come close to this property with these animals um, I am going to heavily resource guard this the protection of these animals if you are not welcome here um, I will resource guard my food I order my dinner you order your dinner you target your fork to your steak and I will target my fork to my shrub and if I see you starting to come across here and target my shrimp, I may allow you once. Then the second time I'm going to say, why don't you get your own? <laughs> so um, resource guarding is very common and very, uh, I would say, misunderstood. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then here, here was what's really cool is we were in a lot of animal, a lot of enclosures last weekend. And you know what, Sylvia, this is what I was thinking. Maybe we address, focus on a future uh, coffee with the critters um, on a live stream review where we get everybody on that was attending this workshop um, in a live streamed episode of Coffee with the Critters, and we can buzz through some pictures and maybe throw some videos. Show some videos. Um, I see you, Katie. So here was something really cool. Uh, the visitors were watching. And I had mentioned when we train in public, it's an opportunity to educate the onlookers what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, how we create motivation, um, why we want to interact with positive reinforcement. Um, I wouldn't say explain applied behavior analysis because they're probably going to woo um, fade out. Um, but you can explain applied behavior analysis in different ways using observable and measurable uh, behaviors to collect data um, and change behaviors. Applied behavior analysis is using environmental events to change behavior. I focus on the science of behavior change. That is what I do, no matter what the animal, whether it's human, non-human. Um, and applied behavior analysis has pigeonholed themselves, for a lack of a better term, to um, primarily being known as used with people within the autistic spectrum. And it is so much more than that. So much more than that. Um, Yes, Sylvia, you might, you know what, you can wear your Sunday morning lounging. I do this when I do my Q&As or my um, interviews up in the office. I have my animal behavior shirt on and I have my pajama pants on. So there you go. Um, yeah, so what we were doing here was I said, raise the target stick high and let's get, this is what's really cool is what we were seeing with bonkers is when we were asking simple behaviors such as, Touch your nose to a stick here. He got it, okay? And then he got what I would call label as bored with such simple behaviors. So I said, let's ask more complex behaviors. Let's get longer recalls. And the more complex the behavior we got, um, working for the same food as the simple behavior. So he could, we could sit here and target like this, but this behavior started to decrease. And what was punishing that behavior was lack of complexity in the behaviors we were asking. So complexity in the behaviors we do ask could be a positive reinforcer behind uh, getting more complex behaviors. Does that make sense? There is a prime, awesome example how positive reinforcers are so much more than food. So when we started asking long recalls, high recalls, like Joanna was asking here, I think this is Joanna Camburn and Sean Whaley, um, we started seeing him respond faster, climb faster, jump further. Um, and each time, the first time we came up to his enclosure, it, we had to lure him out. The second time, he came out when he heard our voice. The third time, he was waiting for us. So is that cool? Is that, that shows that um, using positive reinforcement training is one of an animal's favorite forms of enrichment because it involves not only food, um, it involves positive reinforcement, it involves mental and physical stimulation, 
It empowers the animals. Studies also show that animals in confinement, captivity, enclosures, serious lack, seriously lack problem solving skills. Well, guess what? When we went into these enclosures, we increased the complexity of problem solving skills. Yes. Um, yep. Corey Butler says like contra free loading work, work, work. Um, I'm a big, I've read several studies on contra free loading. Uh, we work on contra free loading here all the time. Studies show that contra free loading is less likely to happen. The more hungry the animal is, but after the animal gets 50% satiated, they're more likely to work for their food versus taking identical free food of less value. I know I do see that here. Um, we uh, contra free loading can be in the form of training. Um, I ask a bobcat to take a free piece of food from my hand right here and it doesn't take it. But then I show a target stick where it has to jump up several branches and it does that and takes food from my hand there. The identical, same size, same freshness, same type of food. That's what it has to be if it's contra free loading. If it takes it up there, then yes, the animal is contra free loading. Um, we even, if you go to our new beautiful website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com, you will see all of our list of webinars, and I believe Contra Freeloading is one of them. And this fall, starting next month, you're going to see our live, we're going to have more live stream topics starting to pop up. Um, in a, an array, believe me, an array of behaviors ranging from parrots, pigeons, pigs, um, um, what else? zoo animals, we'll have them on different species, we'll have them by topics such as understanding reinforcement, working with an overbonded pair. pair. Um, that's a webinar I'm working on right now. Um, so yeah, oops, sorry, there's my website, there it goes. Take a look at our new website. So um, we also, let me, Sylvia says, it was clear the animals got great satisfaction from the training. Even the wolves were more interested in catching the food than getting the drop food. That's coming up. Uh, and um, Sylvia was in our workshop last weekend. Um, we have two more workshops planned for June of 2020. Zoo workshops. Hey, Daphne, I will see you in a couple of weeks. Um, Pam Riley says, contra freeloading seems to kick in the nature of hunt, maybe. Sure. Um, contra freeloading could bring out um, natural skills such as chasing, lunging, jumping, catching in midair, um, food that they don't have, the, that they would do in the wild, that they don't have the opportunity to now. I will see animals, because I work with a lot of animals. Rocky, um, outside of their natural environments. I work with several species of animals from different continents that aren't native to the United States. I work with a lot of wildlife rehab animals um, that are injured, can't be re-released, -re or our ambassador program animals that are native to the United States, that are undomesticated, um, that I see... Um, what was I going to say? Something about, oh, studies also show that animal, in captivity, animals show and tend to prefer moving their bodies in unnatural ways than what they would in the wild. Why is that? Um, probably numerous reasons. Um, they lack predation, so they don't have to keep their eyes out for what's going to eat me. Um, probably ways to play, however you define play. Um, opportunity, just the enrichment found in the ability to move their bodies in parts you, different ways you wouldn't see in the wild. Um, uh, okay. <clears throat> Pacing. When I see an animal pacing, 
Katie, I'm glad you brought that up. It is usually an area of concern for me. Um, I would say when I'm talking about moving their bodies in unnatural ways, could be things like hanging upside down and interacting with enrichment upside down. When I start seeing an animal um, like Rico, our umbrella cockatoo here, he will, what's that term? I can't remember. Um, he'll hang upside down from a wire with his head hanging and walk upside down. Okay. Um, I'm sure some parrots do that in the wild, but probably not a lot. When I see behaviors such as pacing, I am looking at that from like a, a stereotypical behavior, an abnormal repetitive behavior. Um, I guess the difference between moving in unnatural ways is those movements that I'm looking for in unnatural ways are a form of enrichment, whereas abnormal repetitive behaviors, um, they, they, they happen in the same form and the same intensity, usually a way of relieving stress, usually a sign of lack of enrichment. Um, based on my experience, most are due to lack of mentally stimulating environments. And once an abnormal repetitive behavior begins, um, you can tell, you, I can usually tell the severity of it behind how intense it is. I have a video of a monkey going back and forth inside its enclosure going, bam, 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 touch the water dish, bam, 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 touch the water dish. And then what I watch for as I sit there and watch um, I can kind of determine or guesstimate the history of reinforcement, the length of time this um, stereotypical behavior has been practiced by how intense it is. So with this particular primate, I was watching it go bam, 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 touch the water dish, bam, bam, bam. One time it missed the water dish, so it interrupted its series of three touches and then the water dish. So when it bam, 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 it missed the water dish and started to go back and then went whoop and went and touched the water dish and then went back, bam, 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 touched the water dish again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Adrian says, boredom and possibly frustration can't access some desired objects. Yep, mm -hmm. I agree. You can see um, abnormal repetitive behaviors develop out of um, seeing positive reinforcers and not being able to get to that. We see that that is very common within the companion parrot community. Um, Rocky has one. He came to us. Rocky is our be 21 in a couple weeks. Rocky is our 21-year-old um, Moroccan cockatoo that came to us with an abnormal repetitive behavior, very well practiced, where he does cage bar flipping, grabs cage, grabs cage, flip, and not only does he do that, he will scream at the same time in the middle of that flip, and he also goes like this with his head. So it's boom, boom, scream, boom, boom, scream. Um, yeah, very well practiced. So, um, yeah, Sandy says, and Sandy, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. We, uh, myself and Dr. Deb Jones are giving our second all animal species training and behavior workshop here the second weekend in October, a couple of seats left. Um, so Sandy says, can't discharge physical and or mental energy in a normal way. Yeah. And um, we can unknowingly cue abnormal repetitive behaviors to start, uh, behaviors label, label, uh, labeled as anxiety, separation anxiety, um, where a person comes home or a keeper comes into the area and it's paired, it's a conditioned reinforcer, a conditioned punisher, aversive, uh, pending on that person has paired themselves with something. And that's when you usually will see that can be a cue for abnormal repetitive behaviors to start, um, usually associated with the sign of anxiety. Yep, I have a turkey vulture behind me. Um, did. So here, the alligators are some of my favorite animals to train. 
Um, and um, they are setting up a new walkway for me to get into the enclosure. Um, so I told them, this is Melanie, uh, who attended the workshop last weekend. We recall trained the alligators and it was a little cool. So two of them didn't respond very well. So we tried to use environmental events to control behavior. Um, applied behavior analysis is using environmental events to control behavior. So I'm like, why are we only getting one alligator recall? And uh, from the best of my ability that I could tell, it was due to the temperature, time of the sun. So we tried to time it where we trained the alligators when the sun was directly overhead. Last weekend was a little bit of a chilly weekend, overcast, um, some drizzle. But I'll tell you what, <clears throat> the rain was definitely not an aversive um, to stop any training because I was like, does anybody want to get out of the rain? It was like, nope, let's keep on training. So it did not positively punish our behavior of staying out in training. Um, so when I said, okay, when we recall train the alligators, focus on the mechanics. So what we're doing is tap, 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 alligators stand up and come walking up to the front of the enclosure. And I said, how you deliver the positive reinforcer, which was raw meat cut up into small pieces, how you deliver the positive reinforcer can actually be an aversive and you're going to positively punish the behavior of the alligator coming on cue. So it took me some time to figure that how, how to deliver the reinforcer. And once we were done training, because I was focusing on how you deliver the positive reinforcer. So how we deliver is tap, tap, tap. Our bridge is good. You'll see the alligator start to open his mouth. Enter meat on tongs to the left side of the alligator's mouth. And you get it in there and touch anywhere the side of their mouth their mouth is gonna clamp shut. Um, and you want it clamping shut on the tongs so you can pull the tongs out and the meat stays in. And they said it was a lot harder than it looked. I said, because the alligator's gonna start pushing his mouth back and forth like this, trying to find the food. I don't wanna see that behavior happening. What I wanna see is quick, efficient, swift, um, delivery of the reinforcer into the side of the mouth because if you don't get it into the side of the mouth um, you're very likely to hit the tongs on the front of the face now pairing your training with an aversive um, Jen says can you show what you use from point training parrots what do you mean point training I'm not sure what you mean Jen um, Cindy says, can house cats be trained? Your thoughts? Absolutely. I used to live with five. We were just talking about this in our level, level two group discussion the other day. Oh, no, we were talking about this in level one, our level one Q&A yesterday. Absolutely, you can house train. You can train um, cats, house cats. Uh, I used to train mine to target, station, recall, go into a crate, go into the tub take medication, give me a paw target, nose target, step on a scale. Um, <clears throat> in one of the contra freeloading studies I read, they said the only animal they couldn't observe contra freeloading was the house cat. Um, I was just like, well, I didn't work on that too hard then. <clears throat> but yes, when I trained my cats, they seemed to really enjoy the training. What does enjoy mean? Um, as soon as I cue them to do something, bloop, they were right there. Um, yeah, so, okay. Hey, Monica, good to see you in here. I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, Monica says, I know someone who trains dogs, not just pet dogs, but police dogs. They train dogs to sift drugs, bed bugs. His family adopted an 11-year-old cat not too long ago. Cat, cat, cat has been learning to sniff out something for re Reinforcer, just like the dogs. That's cool. Yeah. Um, we have some cool training, so I want to keep moving. Um, 
Sylvia and Melanie and Joanna and Amanda and Sean. I'm going to get in touch with you, see if you're interested in doing a live stream on some of the training we did next month in October. Um, we moved on to the goats. And here's what happens. I said, we're going to go in here because the public goes in here and they feed the goats and they're going to jump on you. So this pairs with what don't you want the animal to do? Okay. A lot of people focus on what they don't want the animal to do. Whereas where replacement behaviors come in handy. What do you want them to do instead? Um, and I said, we're going to go in here. These goats are going to jump on us. So let's start training to get them doing other behaviors than jumping. So we started with hand targets immediately. Touch your hand. And this is about rates of reinforcement. Um, how quick you cue behaviors because if you don't have a positive reinforcer in your hand, they're going to start jumping. Um, so we showed how a hand target could get the goats on a scale. Um, we don't want them jumping. What do we want them to do? We got them doing quite a bit of different things with foot targets. Then we moved on to the bears. Um, and we started with just nose targeting, um, stationing, um, understanding how to deliver reinforcers through this type of interaction. Um, we had the sloth encounter. Um, so, I mean, I was watching. I used to train these sloths. I haven't trained them in a while. Um, they get a lot of other forms of enrichment, so I don't really focus on them. I did train one when he was really small and yes you can recall train them it just might take you a little more time but they actually can move pretty quick um, so we have to work on our mechanics how we deliver the reinforcer identifying reinforcers yesterday in our level one membership we were talking about uh, requesting behaviors and I asked somebody what's your reinforcer once you get the behavior What's the reinforcer you're going to use? They're like, I don't know. And I was like, then don't even think about asking a behavior. I never ask a behavior. I cannot reinforce. If I do not, that's the importance of uh, getting in and gathering as many reinforcers as possible. Um, so you can um, build your list of reinforcers. And I always tell people, don't just focus on food. Because if you do just focus on food, it's not going to be long before you find your stu yourself stuck where you can't, you can't reinforce a behavior because the environment has changed. Just because your dog takes treats from your hand here in your living room doesn't mean it's going to take them from your hand in the vet's office. All right? Um, you have to shape that behavior. Um, very nice, Rock. You have to shape that behavior. Who is cooing? Yes, that is cello. <sighs> um, Katie says, all of this sounds like we need to see saying they are hardwired. Yeah, and we were just talking about that in our level one and level two membership program um, on labels. You'll hear me when you use it. Do I use labels? Yes, I will say... That's nesting behavior. Let me show you, let me describe what like nesting behavior looks like, okay? Um, <clears throat> people get stuck in traps in using labels. Labels, as I said, um, the awesome, what's her name, Kathy Pratt, a BCBA, said, labels put behavior in a fishbowl, okay? And what she means by that is hardwired. I'll take Katie's example. That animal is hardwired. What the hell does that mean? Hardwired, sticks it in a fishbowl, and you don't do anything. It doesn't allow you to do anything to change that behavior or maintain or get it to decrease. Um, <clears throat> so when we use labels such as hardwired, terrible twos, oh, and they're just going through their terrible twos. What does that mean? What does that look like? What terrible twos are is a label used to describe the, the first two years of an animal, including not human animals, um, of learning. Those are prime times that individual is learning things, whether you want them to do or not. 
Um, and if it's the an individual learns that this behavior brings desired consequences to itself, it's likely going to maintain and increase. And we were talking about this yesterday in our, in our live stream Q and A. Um, once an individual learns a particular behavior brings a desired consequence of theirs, desired by them, probably can be undesired by us, it's already learned it. Once you learn two plus two equals four, you can't forget it. So what happens is now you have to come in and counter condition, retrain, all right? But the problem is once the positive reinforcer stops being delivered on whatever type of schedule of reinforcement here for this alternate desired behavior, once the positive reinforcement is stopped, the individual is likely to go back to the behavior it once originally learned, okay? Um, in working with parrots, I'm working with parrots that have a 38 year history of reinforcement for doing certain behaviors. Can you teach old dogs new tricks? Absolutely. So Sunshine, the lesser sulfur crested cockatoo that's up for adoption here from Best Friends, has been plucking his feathers, I was told shortly after he was surrendered there 18 years ago, okay? So I have 18 years of feather plucking to try to counter condition. Some of those follicles may be damaged, they may never be able to come back, but I can tell his plucking on his back is fairly new. So that's what I'm focused on. I'm not focused on this. Um, <clears throat> and he's been here, what is today, to the 22nd? Three months ago, today, I took off for Utah to get sunshine. So he's been here at the Animal Behavior Center less than three months. And I often tell people, the longer an undesired behavior is practiced, the longer it's likely to take you to change, but not near as long to change as what the animal learned how to do it in the first place. So I have 18 years worth of counter conditioning I'm working on with sunshine and in th less than three months we've seen major changes major it's taken me three months to get to this point but i'm working with an 18 year history of reinforcement that's pretty darn fast okay and people say oh you must be so patient to do this kind of training i am one of your least patient persons i'm a very impatient person um, you'll see like abnormal behavior. You'll see me do abnormal behavior, repetitive behaviors due to restriction. I can't sit this long. I need to be up and be moving. Um, so what I look for is small changes. And if I break them down that small, I can see them in one training session. Um, but sometimes it takes me several to see, am I really seeing a change? I don't know. And I will, sometimes I don't know the reinforcer from an undesired behavior. So what I do, if it's an undesired behavior, try not to pair myself with it. Um, and I sit back and observe and try to find the function for that behavior. Once I find the function, now I've identified the positive reinforcer, the reinforcer behind it. Once I've identified the reinforcer behind it, then I move in with my behavior modification um, plans. Okay. Katie says, question on sunshine. Do you think the the what change in environment scenery has also, oh yeah, oh yeah. Change is one of the important things we can provide to our animals. Uh, so the change in environment, every night we were in a different hotel room for four nights on the way home. Um, his environment was constantly, massively changing. When I brought him here, I think he was in the cage for three days, okay? And I was like, you guys, we've got to get sunshine out to keep progress going because he's starting to stay in a stagnant environment for three days. So, yes, this was a massive change for him, but staying in the cage for three days, I saw undesired behavior starting to creep up again that I saw starting to decrease each night on the on the road um, in the hotel rooms. So just out of three days of staying in his cage, I saw undesired behavior start to creep back up again. Um, 
Okay, so I've got a couple more video photos to get through in, in 10 minutes. All right, we used a nose target to teach a giraffe to back up on cue. Um, we can teach a giraffe, we can teach an animal to back up on cue in several different ways. What does the animal already know how to do? So we worked on um, giving a target down low. He would stick his tongue out. And I told him, I said, he's going to pull out his tongue and try to grab the target stick. But differential reinforcement of an incompatible behavior, he can't reach his tongue out when it's coming at him like this. He can't see the stick. And if it's a matter of timing, when he reached over and touched his nose between his two nostrils to the target stick, bam, fully, quickly pull the target stick away. Um, but we also use that to teach him to back up on cue. So we went forward right underneath him. So his head was back here behind us and he had to back up to touch the target stick. So then we start shaping, bridging, delivering reinforcement. Um, here we worked with, this was really cool. We worked with so many things with the lemurs. One was focus and control exercises. And one is, um, I noticed this before they started working with them, but I noticed it really pretty dramatically once they started working with them. So we had two trainers in at a time. Um, these are animals that are, this is Dylan Pickles, which is getting ready to live in this room here in a, a couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> Got to figure that one out because these are animals that are boom, boom, jumping. And they're like shooting over your head. They've already gone across your head before you even know they've gone across your head. High energy animals. And um, so we worked on focus and control exercises. Uh, we worked, I showed them um, luring, which shows the positive reinforcer. I'm not a big fan of teaching via luring because, because what I see when training during luring is the animal, it takes the animal longer to understand the contingency of exactly what behavior they're doing that's earning the reinforcer. So a lure would be something like, I'll show you. We got a pig in here on purpose. Lure would be something like this. Milo. Okay. Um, the, I'm not a big fan of luring. I like to do a lot of shaping without luring. Um, I learn faster if I'm not luring, showing the positive reinforcer to get the behavior. I learn faster if I'm not luring, and the animal understands contingency quicker if I'm not luring. No food. My little touch. Good. The importance of the bridge. Bingo. I've never, oh, let's see. Milo's like, are we training? Teach him to target his nose to my foot. That's good. That's good. I did train him a nose target to my toe a couple weeks ago because I was bored and he wanted something to do. That's Good. Okay. No showing of the food. My, look at my, look at Cello. Cello's like, can I train? Huh? Good. Neither one are hungry. They just both ate. Shello is likely to land on my head now since uh, touch. Good. What did I say? All right. Um, there you go. I'm back with my co host. <laughs> History of reinforcement. Don't reinforce, you must never reinforce an undesired behavior. 
That's the famous words of B.F. Skinner. Um, good luck with that one. Anyways, so what we were doing was showing how to get them to come to a certain area when cued through luring and how to fade that lure. So that's what you see Melanie doing here is asking um, the lemur, uh, probably that was Dill, to go to an area that she was touching, pointing to. We ended up doing this with the bobcat too. Um, you'll see that photo coming up. Um, and then um, we used a variety of reinforcers. One of the biggest things that I saw, and I work with a lot of bonded pairs of animals, <clears throat> bonded people and animals. You'll see animals starting to resource guard people. Um, was what I saw was I told them they, Pickles was doing a lot of behaviors. Dill was watching Pickles be trained. So I said, let's bring them back together because Dill is finding comfort in being closer to Pickles. And we quickly saw Dill starting to um, offer more behaviors um, and give more requested behaviors. That is extremely important. All right. Um, we worked with wolves. These were my favorite to work with over the weekend. So we had six wolves and I threw Lindsay Douglas. She's my right hand trainer here at the center in there. So what we were seeing was if we threw a piece of food, there was a fight. Okay. So we focused on let's get them stationing. So everybody took a wolf and this gets, this is so much more complex than what I'm showing. Um, we got each wolf to focus to station and focus on their particular trainer. And then we ended up um, showing the importance of reinforcing food delivery with another or reinforcing food delivery and how the animal takes food with another food reinforcer. That one was kind of hard for them to grasp. Um, but I probably should have done a training demonstration before. But I couldn't because I didn't have the opportunity to separate the wolves. Um, so this was really cool. We got this on video. If one person lost control of their wolf, we started seeing everybody starting to lose control of their wolves. Um, <clears throat> this was pretty cool. Um, yeah, there was a lot of, there's everybody training their wolf, um, getting behavior. Oh, okay. So I guess that's the end of this session. Let's have a um, future live stream on with all of the attendees of this trainer. Um, this workshop sold out, received great feedback. Um, I've got testimonials from all of them and I thank you. Um, <clears throat> some are professional trainers. Some were using this workshop to determine if they really wanted to take the plunge in pursuing this field. Hands head on. And at the end of the workshop, they said, yes, they do. Um, <clears throat> so I always tell people, you can fine tune your training techniques through training exotic animals. Uh, there's a wide variety of species. They're not domesticated. Did I just make up a new word? Domesticated. A lot of times they want nothing to do with you. A lot of times they do. Um, <clears throat> what are we looking at? Okay, so I've got in touch with the zoo again. Um, some of the people, the attendees, says this was uh, mentioned. This was their best workshop they've ever attended. Um, so I'm already putting into works workshop number two. Workshop number three, increasing your complexity, increasing the complexity um, and how I'm going to do that um, to take it to level two. So these are the two dates we have selected for next year. We accept as soon as I know as soon as I put a registration page up, um, probably both of these will sell out. So um Level one and level two members get first pick. Then I open up to the public. I will announce it in an email newsletter. Um, so there you go. <clears throat> if you like some of the things you've seen here today, um, take a look at our brand new website. 
um, at our level one and level two online learning membership programs. You know, you can find those on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, level one is for companion animals. We have a lot of fun. We had an awesome Q and A in there yesterday. Um, level two is more for people who are more serious about getting in the field of using applied behavior analysis with animals, a wide variety, um, or who just want more content, weekly content. And then we also have our projects, which are species specific. The Parrot Project is now up to 170 subscribers, and most of those subscribers are keep renewing every year. So these are annual programs that we offer, online learning. Um, in a couple of weeks, I know Deb Jones has been saying she's working on it already. I'm working on it in my head, and that drives her nuts, because <laughs> I'm kind of on the fly. I like to go with the flow on, what do you need to work with? Um, and let's change this workshop based mid-paced based on everybody's level of experience. Um, so this workshop is bringing in people from all over the United States. This happens the second weekend, October 12th and 13th, in right here at the Animal Behavior Center. Um, there's our awesome manager, Karen Pratt. She says, don't forget any questions on navigating the website, please email me, Karen at the Animal Behavior Center. Joanna Camber, you are on here, yay! Um, you're in that one photo of the workshop. Um, let me see where it is, which one? Do, do, do. Right here on the right, you're the one queuing, queuing the bobcat to its station, and you did that by, let me take myself off of here real quick so you can see. You did that by fading out the target stick. We no longer need the target stick. Remove it. Boom. The target stick is a prompt, a temporary tool to get behavior. Um, and we got to the point where we could remove the prompt and just use our hands. Um, then, then we have the, um, I'm excited for this one. This is going to be a lot of fun. It's in the Midwest. It's going to be in Chicago, the C4AW event. You can find, um, you can register on their website at c4aw.org. Uh, myself and several other presenters will be there, um, such as the awesome Dr. Jason Crean, Bonnie Zimmerman, um, Caroline, uh, Robin Shawokas, and several others. Um, it's going to be a whole weekend of fun in Chicago focused on avian wellness. Um, and then I have a lot more in between, but I just don't have everything up on the events page yet. Uh, September of 2020, myself will be out at Best Friends Animal Society in Kanab, Utah, giving a workshop and a summit through the Pet Professional Guild. Again, I have five workshops I will be giving, and I have that uploaded to their website. I'll be giving workshops with pigs and parrots, and I'm honored to say I will be speaking the final night of the event at the ending dinner. And you're just going to have to guess on what my talk is going to be so there you go. Um, for anybody else that still stay tuned, if you are interested in our services, don't have the time, don't have the money, or just really like what we do. Um, we have a referral program. It's even for people that are in our level one, level two, and projects. What the referral program is, for every five people you refer to our services that sign up that earns you a free one hour consultation behavior training consultation with me okay there you go and i have to go because my friend's birthday party is today maggie bernath um and we she is having a party here at the moose lodge in sylvania ohio and part of the proceeds go to our nonprofit, the Sam I Can Foundation. So if anybody is local to the Sylvania, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio area, please stop down for an afternoon of fun um, from one to five. All right, take care. Um, if you guys have any questions, be, feel free to email me, laura at the animal behavior center.com. All right, we'll see you next week. Coffee with the critters, stay tuned. Right.